Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our event on Capitalism as Religion with our special guest, Professor Eugene McCarraher of Villanova University. Our program this evening is the third of a fall term series of programs at St. Olaf College on the topic of capitalism, freedom, and community. My name is Edmund Santuri. I'm a professor at St. Olaf College and Morrison Family Director of the College's Institute for Freedom and Community, the institute sponsoring tonight's event and the fall series just mentioned. The purpose of St. Olaf's Institute for Freedom and Community is to stimulate and support free inquiry and meaningful debate of important political and social issues among students, faculty, staff, and the larger public. By exploring diverse ideas about politics, markets, and society, the Institute aims to challenge presuppositions, question easy or comfortable answers, and foster constructive civil dialogue among those with differing values and contending points of view. For help in organizing our event tonight, as always, very special thanks go to Institute staff, Associate Director Eric Grell, Administrative Assistant Linda Carlson, and Student Assistant Jess Horst, Thanks also to Jeff O'Donnell, Joshua Wyatt, and the St. Olaf Broadcast Media Services crew, and to Andrea Galswick, Dan Hollering, and Carrie Vanderveen of St. Olaf Marketing and Communications. Finally, thanks to St. Olaf College faculty and students who have integrated their study with our, our event this evening, particularly participants in the Public Affairs Conversation Program supported by the Institute and courses offered by the St. Olaf Religion Department. To remind our virtual audience members, you are invited to submit a question at any point during the discussion this evening by using the Participate tab on the streaming page. We are honored to have with us tonight as our guest, Eugene McCarraher, who is Professor of Humanities and History at, Univer at uh, Villanova University, but who has also taught at Princeton and the University of Delaware. In addition to publishing scholarly articles, he has written many essays and reviews for a number of public intellectual and popular outlets, including Baffler, the Chicago Tribune, Commonweal, Dissent, The Nation, In These Times, The Hedgehog Review, and Raritan. He is the author of two important books, Christian Critics, Religion and the Impasse in Modern Thought by Cornell University Press, and most relevant to our discussion tonight, the Enchantments of Mammon, How Capitalism Became the Religion of Modernity, published by Harvard University Press in 2019. He is currently working on another book, A History and Critique of Automation, and a series of articles on what he calls Small C Communism. Gene McCarraher, welcome. We're pleased to have you with us this evening. Thank you very much, Ed, and uh, greetings to everyone. Gene, uh, again, our topic tonight is capitalism as religion, and we are interested, again, especially in the central theme of your very stimulating book, The Enchantments of Mammon, How Capitalism Became the Religion of Modernity. David Hart, a prominent theologian who doesn't offer praise very often, says this about, a, about the book in a review, and I quote, The Enchantments of Mammon is a magnificent book. It is, before all else, a sheer marvel of patient scholarship, history on a grand scale, and in the best tradition of historical writing, a comprehensive account of the rise and triumph of capitalism in the modern age, not only as an economics, but also as our most pervasive and dominant system of ultimate values. But the book is far more than that. It's also a work of profound moral insight, a searing spiritual critique of a vision of reality that reduces everything mysterious, beautiful, fragile, and potentially transcendent in human experience to instances of or opportunities for acquisition and personal power, and that seeks no end higher than the transformation of creation's substantial goods into the lifeless abstraction of monetary value. End of quotation. High praise indeed. Again, coming from someone not well known <laughs> for handing out praise. Congratulations to you, Eugene, for that um, remarkable commendation. Uh, and, uh, and who am I to disagree with David Bentley Hart? <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Wise. <laughs> Let's just start, Gene, with a couple of general questions invited by the title of your book. What sure. do you mean when you say that capitalism became the religion of modernity? 
And how is this related to what you call the enchantments of mammon? Sure. Um, basically, what I'm trying to do uh, in this book uh, is show that I think that Max Weber's account of what he called the disenchantment of the world uh, was wrong. Uh, there's a certain kind of uh, story that uh, m moderns tell about themselves, uh, which is that with the advent of capitalism and of science, uh, that the world was disenchanted. That in other words, we no longer believe that the world uh, is animated by some kind of invisible forces. Uh, we don't believe in angels, fairies, spirits. Uh, we may not even believe in gods. But even if we believe in gods, that uh, we don't believe really, uh, according to this story, that uh, God or these forces exert any kind of real power uh, in the natural world. In other words, we, we live in what Charles Taylor would later call an imminent frame uh, from which all kinds of spiritual forces or invisible uh, animate forces have been uh, excluded. So this world of enchantment that uh, pre-modern peoples believed in, uh, whether they were tribal peoples to you know, medieval Christians, who believed that uh, you know, woods and, uh, and stones and rivers and other places could either be animated by spirits or were somehow sacramental in nature. In other words, matter could convey something of divine grace and divine love. According to this story, all of that's been swept away. Uh, either by the, uh, the impersonal agency of science, uh, the way in which it investigates nature without presupposing any sort of supernatural, uh, supernatural being, and also by capitalism, uh, which reduces uh, human relationships, uh, certainly at least market relationships, to calculable uh, pecuniary values. Now, what I'm arguing is that this account is, is profoundly wrong. Uh, and I, I think that uh, there, I, I have two fundamental bases for this. I mean, one is theological and the other is historical. You know, I believe that, um, since I believe that the world is indeed a sacramental place, uh, I don't think that there's a sense in which, I don't think that we've ever been disenchanted. Uh, the world couldn't possibly be disenchanted. Uh, if, if you believe that the world is uh, a sacramental place, you believe with Gerard Manley Hopkins that the world is charged with the grandeur of God. And so for me, the question then becomes, if the world can't be disenchanted, can it be, as I say in the book, misenchanted? Uh, can, uh, is it possible that we can shift our sense of what is real in the world or what is, uh, is fundamental to, to the world? Can we shift that belief to something else? And I think that what's uh, what's done with capitalism is that this essential this property is essentially assigned to money. Uh, you know, I think um, I think you see glimmers of this in uh, somebody who considered himself you know, extremely secular, and that would be Karl Marx uh, when when he talks about commodity fetishism uh, in uh, the first volume of Capital. It's clear to Marx that money has become um, a kind of moral and ontological arbiter of what's real. Uh, and you see this also, I think, in um, in conventional capitalist economics that you would, you know, see taught in uh, in a typical economics class. There's a um, there's a there's a concept in economics called effective demand, and what effective demand essentially says is that if you don't have enough money to pay for, say, a bottle of water, your thirst does not exist uh, as as a matter of the market. So that's why I think that what's going on um, with, with capitalism is a replacement of God with money as this kind of, as I said, moral and ontological arbiter of what's real. And, you know, I think, uh, I think I'm able to trace this, uh, this, the development of this often inadvertent and unconscious uh, assumption about the world in many, many, many different genres. Uh, from economics to advertising to industrial design to business journalism uh, and many of the other uh, many of the other genres of capitalist culture from the about the 17th uh, to the to the mid 20th century. 
Yeah, thank you, Jane. If, if we could just stay uh, a little bit with this uh, point of your argument with Weber. Max Weber, of course, a uh, very important figure uh, in intellectual history. Um, wasn't, wasn't he on to something with the idea of disenchantment? I mean, for example, uh, historical or scientific explanation, you go into a organic chemistry course today, um, people are not in the way of offering explanations. They're not going to be offering appeals to spirits, that sort of thing. They're going to say that that sort of consideration is irrelevant to the kind of investigation we're about. I mean, wasn't Weber saying something like that has, is new and a new element, a feature of the modern world? You're not denying that, certainly... are you? No, certainly not. Uh, you know, as a matter of uh, cultural history, you know, over the last few centuries, Weber is certainly right to say, was certainly right to say, that people, scientists, for example, don't take into account, you know, these kinds of sacramental forces or these, or this sacramental view of the world. And, you know, he was right to say that they don't have to. Uh, but I think that, you know, from a, certainly from a pre-modern standpoint, this would be to exclude very important aspects of reality, uh, you know, from one's from one's account of the world, and also uh, to to reduce it uh, to simply these these visible or calculable forces. Um, in the case of capitalism, I think it's I think it's especially uh, pernicious because, as I said, if if in effect money becomes the the criterion for what's real. Uh, or for what is good, then, you know, first of all, I think you really have replaced God with money. I mean, you, you really have um, unconsciously done so, or po perhaps even consciously done so, say, in the case of Ayn Rand uh, in, in the 20th century. Um, so I would, I would concede that Weber, as a matter of explaining, you know, how people actually conduct science, or how they actually conduct capitalism, he's certainly right to an extent. I just don't think that he tells the whole story. Uh, one of my favorite phrases in the book, um, you talk about pecuniary transubstantiation <laughs> as a dimension of capitalist religion. Uh, transubstantiation, of course, is the term denoting the Roman Catholic view that in the Eucharist or communion, the bread and wine are sacramentally transformed into the body and blood of uh, Jesus Christ. What, what is pecuniary transubstantiation, as you're using that expression? Well, it's, it's basically uh, my sort of theological take on Marx's notion of uh, commodity fetishism. So when you take, uh, you know, I, I mean, this is a sort of, uh, you know, little lesson in commodity fetishism here. So the notion of commodity fetishism turns on the distinction between use value and exchange value, right? So you've got a cup or you've got, uh, you know, the shirt I'm wearing or, you know, some other sort of an object. The use value is the cup holds water and the shirt provides adornment and, you know, protection. Once you start selling it, its actual value, so to speak, becomes pecuniary. Uh, and so what matters in in capitalist exchange of course is the pecuniary value um and it seems to me that a lot of this turns on how one defines that word value uh so in, in effect what happens to an object when it is sold on the market is it basically is transubstantiated it becomes something that is purely about the money that it can garner in the marketplace and in fact, I, you know, I'd even add that uh, Marx, in a, there's a passage in Capital in the first volume where he, in fact, compares this, this uh, notion of the commodity to the Eucharist. Now that's Except he doesn't, use, he doesn't use the term transubstantiation. Yeah. Uh, but uh, couldn't somebody just say, well, this isn't really kind of a mark of um, enchantment in the modern world, it's just a kind of metaphorical way of thinking, or uh, it's a way of talking. Well, it's a way of talking. It's not. It's not really what the medievals thought might be happening in the material world. 
Well, I think arguably the medi some medievals might have actually have thought that that was what was happening. Uh, because you do have, uh, you know, in the Middle Ages, these injunctures against the worship of mammon. And what, what that often boils down to is um, accepting money as the basic standard of, of one's morality and, and of one's uh, activity in the marketplace. Um, and I think also in response to the idea that this is simply a metaphor, meta first of all, metaphors matter. I think that metaphors shed light on um, ways of thinking. And look, when we are in, I think we are in fact acting as though the monetary value of something is in fact its most important aspect. Um, and that, I think, is based on certain kinds of, as I often say, unconscious and inadvertent assumptions uh, about how the world operates. So there is an effect a way in which I think we are always acting as though the world is in fact animated by money. I mean, you know, we talk about how will the market react to this as though the market is some kind of a thing apart from us. Uh, we, we often uh, ask, you know, how will the markets respond as though we're talking about, again, something that's different from us and our own activities. This is, uh, you know, this is a, 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 a very common way of, I think, turning objects and human processes basically into deities. Very interesting. Um, in a chapter entitled The New Testament of Capitalism, you identify neoliberalism as one deep expression of capitalist uh, religiosity in the modern world, neoliberalism. That's a word thrown around a lot these days, usually by people who don't like what the word signifies. <laughs> but what do you mean by neoliberalism and how is it an expression of capitalism as a religion? in the modern world? Well, neoliberalism, I mean, you're right. You know, there are some people who would argue that neoliberalism is, isn't even a thing. Uh, you know, I think neoliberalism is a thing, you know, first of all. And I would define neoliberalism as, in a sense, the, the apogee or maybe even the, or maybe more to the point, the nadir uh, of, of, of capitalist religiosity uh, and ideology. Neoliberalism is an ideology in which everything about the world, and I mean everything, uh, is seen in terms of money and markets. Uh, you know, there have been various kinds of definitions given by uh, Marxists such as David Harvey, uh, you know, who emphasize the political and the economic aspects of this. Uh, David Harvey, and uh, I'm also thinking about Wendy Brown, has also uh, written very, very well on this, about how neoliberalism tries to insulate markets from any kind of democratic scrutiny at all, and even tries to turn government itself into a kind of capitalist enterprise. Uh, you know, you saw this in both Republican and Democratic administrations over the last 30 to 40 years. Um, but I think that what, what makes it, a, in a sense, a religion, as I show in that chapter, is that when you are reading some of these celebrants of neoliberalism from Friedrich Hayek uh, and Ludwig Mises to, uh, you know, to, I, to I, the person I think is, is, the, uh, is the apotheosis of this, Ayn Rand. Um, they're talking about the world as, as a market. You know, they, they, that is how they view the world. That is how they conceptualize the universe. And I do mean the universe. Uh, you know, not just uh, not just political economy, but uh, Hayek and, and Rand especially are are very, very explicit about saying that uh, the only way to view the universe is in terms of uh, market forces. Um, you know, and Rand, I think, is the one who really brings out the religiosity of, of this way of thinking in her books, even though Rand is a uh, was an avowed atheist. Uh, you know, she's very clear that money is the standard of value in capitalist civilization, or should be. And uh, that, is, that is the quintessence of, of the neoliberal imagination, in my view. Thank you, Gene. I think now might be a good time to go to our first video question from Teddy Holthaus. Good evening. My name is Teddy Holthaus. I am a sophomore here at St. Olaf College. And I am asking my question on behalf of the public affairs conversation. Mr. McCarriher, are there any aspects to capitalism that you see as positive and beneficial to society? 
are there any parts of capitalism that you see that you would like to see people hold up as worthy of striving for in societies where capitalism holds sway? Thank you very much for your time, and I, en and I look forward to hearing your answer. Have a nice night. Well, thank you. Um, I address this question actually in the prologue of my book, uh, you know, in a certain way. I don't want to deny at all that during the, what I'll call the capitalist epoch, uh, you know, of human history, that there have been, you know, there have been advances made in, uh, in the material welfare uh, of, of those parts of humanity where capitalism has held sway. I mean, it would be simply <clears throat> silly and churlish, you know, to deny that. However, what I would immediately add, you know, to that is that these benefits have usually been not so much the benefit of capitalism, but of struggles against capitalism, uh, or of uh, struggles to at least try to humanize it and control it in some way. You know, it's often left out of this picture when people talk about the, you know, the spread of the benefits of capitalism are things like political parties and labor movements and, um, you know, social movements, which have had to fight often with, often against intense violence uh, to, to try to moralize uh, or tame this beast uh, of, of capitalism. Um, so at the, at, at, you know, on the one hand, I would not want to deny that, that there's been, uh, you know, as they say, progress has been made. But I also have to say that one of the things that I'm trying to trace in this book has been the e extremely exorbitant prices that have been exacted uh, by the capitalist way of achieving that progress. Uh, there, there's been all kinds of human and ecological destruction uh, that's been wrought, um, you know, for the sake of this of this capitalist progress. And I think it's well overdue that we have some kind of a moral and historical and spiritual reckoning uh, about the costs uh, that that we've inflicted on ourselves and on the planet uh, for all of this. Um, you know, as as for the second question. Um, you know, what if are there any virtues that I would recommend to those, you know, parts of the world where capitalism either has not yet arrived or it is it has arrived recently? Uh, actually, I, I would hope that they would follow a different model of, of development. Uh, and, uh, you know, that used to be something that was said by, you know, socialists, you know, or Marxists, should we follow the socialist model of uh of development, uh, especially in underdeveloped nations. And, uh, you know, I would have to say that that hasn't worked out so well. But then, you know, in the 70s, there were these alternative models of development that were being proposed by economists such as E.F. Schumacher, uh, which constitute, you know, what one might call a third way. And now I know that third way phrase is often dismissed by Marxists as nothing but another sort of bourgeois ruse. Uh, but I, but I do think that there are forms of socialism, and I do think that there are forms of uh, forms of, of non-capitalist economic development that have not yet been tried. And uh, you know, I wish we would explore. I wish we could we would uh, put more energy into exploring these kinds of of uh, or these these models of economic development. Yeah, thank you, Gene. I wonder if we couldn't pursue Teddy's question, or at least some dimensions of Teddy's question, a bit more. Um, I mean, how do you respond to a to a more modest, chastened defense of markets than perhaps what gets depicted by neoliberals and so forth? I mean, in this more modest, chastened account, I mean, capitalism isn't the basis of a religion or a gateway to some kind of grand historical eschatological <laughs> consummation, but a practical system that does some human good and therefore has some moral justification. I mean, I'm thinking here the arguments of somebody like uh, Virgil Storr. This is an economist, actually a guest our institute hosted just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, or Brent Waters, you may have heard of him, who offers a kind of uh, Christian defense of capitalism in his book, entitled Just Capitalism, and he's sort of uh, punning on just somewhat, that is to say, capitalism that is favored from the point of view of justice, but also it's a kind of low-flying appreciation of it. 
Now, people like Storr and Waters, I mean, they propose, for example, that market societies, you hear this quite often, have done more for the poor than non-market non societies, and they typically offer or draw on a mountain of empirical evidence uh, to support that claim. Now, in these accounts, capitalism or the market economy isn't perfect. Um, that is to say, those who defend capitalism in this relatively modest and chastened way acknowledge that economic innovation and productivity often come at the expense of short-term loss and displacement, and there is certainly unequal distribution of capitalism's rewards. These unfortunate effects do need to be mitigated by state and other social interventions, uh, but capitalism, market economies, globalization have done in this account more, again, more for the alleviation of poverty than alternative systems, and that fact presumably has great uh, moral significance. So I mean, even a liberal political theory like John Rawls's theory of justice which favors economic schemes that promote the interest of the least advantage in society. Even such a liberal theory then, if these arguments are right, has reason to commend and support capitalism as what justice requires. Again, a recent guest of ours, uh, Virgil Storr, makes precisely uh, this argument. I mean, I, um, you do say, as you, as you just mentioned, you say at the beginning of your book that identifying the benefits of capitalism as a response to your argument is a red herring a distraction from the main issue. Uh, you do admit to capitalism's achievements, but that point seems to me gets buried in an avalanche of critique as the book unfolds. I mean, I'm just wondering, what would you say in response to these people who are offering what they regard to be as a relatively modest defense of capitalism as the best system, even though it needs to be corrected and adjusted in all kinds of ways? Well, how much time do we have? Uh, I, I guess I'll, you know, I'll, I'll try to keep this uh, as brief as, as possible. I guess that one of the first things I'd say is that um, modest defenses of capitalism never seem to take into account what I consider to be the basic immodesty of capitalism itself. Uh, it's, you know, it, its capacity to demand more and more and more and more of people and of resources of the planet uh, in order to produce this uh, wealth. The second thing I would say is that a lot of these defenses of capitalism as, uh, you know, as providing more and more wealth for the poor or more and, well, well, more, and more wealth for people in general, fails to answer a, a very basic question that I think is posed in this book most eloquently by John Ruskin, which is, what do you mean by wealth? Uh, you know, it seems to me that one of the problems with a lot of these defenses of capitalism, and not just these defenses of capitalism, but it seems to me all of them, you know, no matter how modest or immodest they might be, is that they seem to take the, the, the volume of the gross domestic product as your basic standard of how an economy has developed. Uh, in other words, you just count up the sheer amount of stuff, uh, the sheer amount of goods and services that you've produced, and you tell yourself, well, we've developed. Well, what Ruskin wanted to ask with his own definition of wealth is, uh, can we make distinctions between uh, you know, goods and services that actually contribute to human flourishing and those that don't? Um, and I think that I would argue, and, and I do argue in this book, that I think that by that standard, uh, a lot of what we consider wealth in capitalist societies um, is actually what Ruskin himself gave the term ilth. Uh, that it actually detracts uh, from human flourishing and that it actually does a great deal to destroy human relationships and to destroy uh, the to destroy the uh, you know the the biosphere you know for that for that matter and I'd also again emphasize uh, to these modest defenses of capitalism that you have not had the distribution of this wealth however you want to call it the distribution of this wealth has not been, fair, it has not been equitable, except through political parties and social movements. In other words, not from capitalism itself. Uh, these, these are, uh, this is a point that I think really needs to be hammered home when these kinds of defenses of capitalism are, uh, are, are brought forward. Well, capitalism has done all this. No, it hasn't. Uh, it's, it's been pushback against capitalism. And, you know, Sure, is uh, is a 
is some kind of a regulated capitalism or is some kind of a uh, a more modestly uh, a more modestly performed sort of capitalism is that better than a sort of rip roaring laissez faire capitalism sure um, I'm not I'm not one necessarily who's trying to make the uh, you know the good the enemy of the best but uh, it seems to me that uh, in the end what these sort of modest defenses fail to take into account is the really relentless logic of capital itself. As, I mean, I, and, and I think that, you know, history bears this out. Yeah, uh, let's go in a slightly different direction. Um, uh, in your book, uh, you, you give a, an historical account, not only of how capitalism has unfolded in, in the United States, but also, um, an account of the various challenges to the enchantments of capitalist religion. Um, and, you know, I, to, to be honest, you, they don't seem to have much steam in your historical account, these challenges. Uh, you could say that you tell a rather, from your point of view, a rather desultory story. Uh, movements that try to challenge capitalism are not wholly critical finally, or they peter out or they compromise, and capitalism seems to march on. Um, examples abound in your account. The 19th century populism, which is deep down capitalist in your interpretation. Or Hawthorne, the failed Brook Farm uh, quasi-communistic exper experiment at the beginning of the 19th century. Or the movement of aesthetic anarchism, other movements. All of these, in your own account, despite what they say, are either stealth practitioners of capitalist religion or flameouts. I mean, your, your account of the Occupy movement, for example, is representative in that regard. That movement comes and goes quickly. It gets continued in a way with the Bernie Sanders movement, but it still seems, in your account, like a prophetic voice in the wilderness. Your historical travelogue is largely a story of capitalism's predominance capitalism's victory, the process leading to which seems inexorable. Um, so this brings us to your solution uh, to capitalism's enchantment, a solution you associate with romanticism and characterize variously as romantic sacramentalism or romantic, romantic socialism, which is a revival of what you call the sacramental uh, imagination. Um, uh, just what is going on there in that proposal? I mean, given this, what I think is a fairly rel relentlessly dismal account, again, from someone with your own point of view, uh, how is this romantic counterpoint going to set things aright in your view? Well, you know, first of all, in response, I'm not sure that it is. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, you're, you're absolutely right that most of my book is kind of a, a tragic tale, uh, either of uh, co-optation or of, uh, you know, as you, as you put it, uh, flame out, flame out uh, prophecy. Um, I think that the lineage of romant capital R romanticism that I trace uh, in this book is mostly a lineage of criticism and certainly not one of political victory. Um, I think my my interest in the in the tradition of romantic anti-capitalism that I trace in this book is not to say that it has been at all effective uh, politically in uh, in certainly in overthrowing capitalism. I mean, I think it has had I think it has had some effect in drawing attention to some of capitalism's uh, worst depredations, um, and I think that's all to the good. I think what romanticism has emphasized, uh, well, a number of things. I mean, first of all, it has tried to emphasize again that the world is a sacramental place and that therefore human beings should relate themselves to it and to each other uh, with that in mind. And that, uh, you know, this kind of sacramental view of the world would indeed issue in a different kind of political economy uh, and even in a different kind of technics, you know, for that matter. Um, the Romantic tradition has also, I think, affirmed, I think, workers' control over production, uh, more certainly more than the capitalist view, but also, I think, more than the standard Marxist view uh, of, and a lot of the socialist traditions of the 19th and 20th centuries. 
You know, we usually think that, oh, yeah, workers control, that's that's socialist. Well, not necessarily. Uh, you know, many socialists uh, felt that, in fact, capitalist forms of organization were uh, were, in fact, quite good and productive and wanted to, you know, take them into the socialist phase of um, of history. Um, so I think that the the romantic affirmation of things such as crafts, such as craft, uh, such as uh, artisanal creativity and uh, autonomy are really valuable things that we need to reaffirm uh, and, and to renovate. Uh, certainly, as we move into a phase of capitalism, which is trying to automate so many of our uh, jobs out of existence, um, this is this is something that I think we need to to recapture this sense that people matter, that people and their skills and their and their creativity matter, and that that they shouldn't simply be mechanized away for the purposes of uh, profits and productivity. Um, so I think that the the romantic tradition has been invaluable as a source of critique as a source of insight and, and as a source of uh, imagination of things different. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I'd certainly have to concede that politically uh, it has often been a non-starter. But, uh, you know, I'm a historian. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm simply reporting the news. Thank you, and Gene. And it's mostly... <laughs> Thank you, Gene. Uh, perhaps now the second video question from Erica Collin. Can romanticism still be a moving force for the enchantment of individuals in the modern era? Thank you. Yeah, well, I think it actually is. Uh, you know, I, I make an argument in this book that, for example, a lot of the ecological movement, uh, as we know it, uh, was capital R romantic uh, in its origins, whether we're talking about people like John Ruskin, uh, who was, uh, I think, one of the first and most prescient uh, prophets of the ecological catastrophe that was uh, going to be wrought by, by capitalist industry. Uh, certainly figures like William Morris uh, as well, John Muir uh, in, the, in the American tradition, you know, all the way to the, you know, the sort of new uh, modern sort of ecological movements that emerged from the 1960s, um, you know, epitomized uh, by, well, I, I guess I shouldn't say epitomized, more uh, narrated by people such as Theodore Rozak uh, and uh, Kenneth Rexroth. So I would argue not only that it can, it already has, uh, you know, to a, to a considerable degree. And I also want to say that I think uh, as as uh, I guess pessimistic as my account of uh, Occupy was in the uh, in the epilogue to the book, I think there's a great deal that's that's actually um, capital R romantic about about the Occupy movement. Uh, you know, this idea that we we want not just uh, you know political uh, equity in terms of political economy, but also that we want a beloved community as well. Uh, and that we don't simply want to judge that political economy by the amount of goods and services that it provides, but how does it foster more loving and generous and humane relationships, which I think has been, you know, this, this notion has been at the kernel, has, has been at the center of the, uh, of the romantic movement. Uh, um... Do you ever feel that the appeal to the romantic movement is a kind of intellectualist move on your part or an elitist move of a sort? I mean, it, 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 when you think of the romantic poets, you think of Gerard Manley Hopkins, Wordsworth, and so forth, you're talking about a relatively r rarefied atmosphere. Um, are you talking to other intellectuals when you make this kind of appeal? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, first of all, I, I think it's, I, I actually think it's kind of elitist to call it elitist, uh, to be honest. Um, the, the sort of romantic tradition that I'm tracing isn't simply a literary and artistic movement. Uh, you know, I think, I think that's one of the problems with the way we think about romanticism as historians. Uh, we think of it as Wordsworth. We think of it as Blake. We think of it as, uh, you know, romantic painters or, you know, Beethoven, you know, or some, something like this. 
we don't look at romantic social criticism. Uh, we don't look at the fact that the romantics were, in fact, you know, some of the some of the greatest um, celebrants, you know, for example, of opposition to mechanization, uh, of, uh, of affirmation of artisanal and craft values, uh, that a romantic vision was central to much of the modern ecological imagination uh, and, and the politics that issue from that. Uh, you know, I think that there was a great deal of romanticism, in fact, in uh, certain kinds of socialism uh, in, in Europe and, uh, and the United States in the 19th and 20th centuries. John Ruskin and William Morris were very important in shaping the, uh, not just the imagination, but some of the policies of the British Labor Party uh, in, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So I would argue that, in fact, romanticism has had uh, a considerable impact on, again, you know, not just, uh, you know, poets and musicians and, and painters, but also on politics itself and the way that we think about uh, subjects such as uh, ecology and technology and, uh, you know, craft, certainly the arts and crafts movement that I talk about in the book. So what you say here actually anticipates another question that I was going to ask, and this has reference to um, your critique of people like Alastair McIntyre and the so-called Benedict option. You know, this, this, this idea that the only proper response to the larger capitalistic world is a kind of mon monastic withdrawal from it. Uh, people need to retreat from the capitalistic world into sectarian enclaves, countercultural communities uh, informed by anti-capitalistic social practices. Uh, we await, McIntyre famously proposed, a new Saint Benedict, as you note, uh, the fifth and sixth century founder of the Benedictine mon monastic movement. You say we don't need a new Benedict, but a new Saint Francis. And you cite as an instance that Saint's namesake, <laughs> Pope Francis, and particularly his encyclical Laudato Si on the environment with its critique of capitalist culture. But I'm just wondering what you would say about this. I mean, isn't Christianity itself, since you cite the Pope here, becoming, if it hasn't become already, a kind of sectarian witnessing counterculture in American society? And can romantic sacramentalism be anything more than a kind of sectarian counterculture counterpoint? Well, certainly not if you retreat into the sort of communities that people like Alistair McIntyre and Rod Dreher, uh, you know, advocate. Um, look, the reason I cite Francis is that Francis is somebody who goes out into the world. Uh, this is, uh, you know, I mean, this, you know, Benedict was about retreating into, as you say, into these monastic communities. Francis is about going out among the people. Uh, and uh, preaching the good news. And it seems to me that uh, romanticism, the, we, we should have a kind of romanticism of the streets, uh, a, a sort of romanticism that is not afraid to go out into the world and doesn't try to keep its light under a bushel basket, as a, as a famous Galilean once put it. Uh, so this is, this is why I think that, uh, you know, Pope Francis, for example, why his uh, encyclical Laudato Si is, is such a romantic, romant is such a, a remarkable romantic document, because uh, you know he advocates not retreating, you know, and drawing up the you know the drawbridge, uh, and, and and simply becoming sectarian, but actually going out into the world and trying to influence politics with this kind of sacramental vision that he lays out in uh, in that encyclical. Um, you know, he invokes Francis and he invokes sacramentality consistently throughout this document. So I actually, I actually think that romanticism is, is, is inclined to, toward the exact opposite of, of this kind of withdrawal uh, into this sort of Benedict option, which, first of all, I don't think is going to happen anyway. I, I, I just don't see how this is, uh, I just don't see how this is practicable uh, in, in the contemporary world. And as I said, secondly, I think there's, uh, there is in this kind of Drarian uh, sectarianism a kind of admission of defeat and uh, a, a kind of spiteful picking up one's marbles and going home uh, and, and sort of conceding defeat. And I don't want to do that. Thank you. Uh, 
I think we have uh, time for one more question for me before we go to general Q&A. And this is maybe not a fair question to put to you with so little time left in our exchange. But you say very little in the book about race. Um, the book was published, of course, in 2019, before the roiling events of 2020, the aftermath of George Floyd, and so forth. Uh, had you still been working on the book through that time and publishing it later, would, it, would the book look any different? Well, I think yes and no. Um, I, I think, um, to, to take the second part of that, you know, uh, first, uh, the no. Uh, I, I think that it's not clear to me exactly how a consideration of, of race in the book would have substantially changed the argument that, um, that, that capitalism is a form of enchantment. I think that to the extent that I do uh, address race in the book, and I think it's a legitimate criticism that's been made in several quarters that I don't go far enough to do this. Uh, so I guess I'm going in the yes direction uh, part of the, part of this answer. I think it would have looked different in the sense that um, it is true that historically oppressed communities um, have usually had a very different and usually very incisive look at the way that a system actually works. Uh, and I do think that to the extent that I do address um, issues of race in this book, I think I'm cap I think I'm able to to demonstrate that that was indeed the case. Uh, I just w I guess I just wish in retrospect that I had done it um, more consistently, uh, and and with uh, well with a greater number of, of cast of characters, to to an already huge cast of characters. So I mean it's I think it's a legitimate criticism, and uh, if I had if I'd spent maybe another year or two in the book, or if in fact I had had to you know, publish the book a bit later, it, uh, it would have been, it would have looked different, yes. Thank you. Uh, let's now go to the third video question from Rowan Wilson. Hello, my name is Rowan Wilson. I'm from the class of 2024, and uh, thank you so much for coming and talking with us today. When reading your article on how we, in a way, deify money, I was reminded of a fiction book I really enjoy called um, American Gods by Neil Gaiman. And in this book, there's a conflict between the old gods of the time of enchantment and the new gods of modern society. And these are like gods of the internet or cell phones or globalization or the market. These gods are created entirely by society's kind of worship and reliance on these major elements of our modern society. Now in your article, you seem to mostly focus on the deification of money but I feel that we as a society worship and are almost even enslaved to many of these other modern gods like our cell phones and cars. And I'm just wondering what you think about that. Uh, thanks. I would, I would see a lot of these uh, devices as maybe part of the iconography of contemporary capitalism uh, as, as part of the, um, you know, maybe the industrial design of, uh, of enchantment. Um, yeah, I mean, these objects are in fact designed to, uh, to, to absorb so much of our attention. Uh, you know, some people like Mark Zuckerberg have, and Sean Parker have as much as admitted this over the last few years. And, you know, I can't emphasize enough that a lot of the, uh, algorithms on which these devices depend, um, are about gathering data for the purposes of, of acquiring greater uh, ability to accumulate capital and to get you to, to buy more things and to know and to sell you more things uh, and to, to simply get you more involved in the ritual practices of the, uh, of, of the, of the capitalist religion. So, yeah, I, th I think, you know, we're, we're at the point where, uh, you know, even the tech, the very basic techniques of capitalism, the very everyday techniques of capitalism are designed to, to foster this enchantment and to enchant us. And they do. Now, how we go about, you know, disenchanting that, you know, in, in that sense, 
I don't think it's enough to simply say, well, I'm not, I'm just not going to consult my phone for, you know, three or four hours a day. I'm not going to go on the internet for, you know, so much length of time. I think you have to have a remaking of the techniques. You, you have to remake the technology in a way that's consonant uh, with the kinds of values that you want to foster, because technology always is a reflection of the, t of the values that you want to foster. Uh, so I think that in a world where, in, in a post-capitalist world, you know, if we would ever achieve one, you would have a very different kind of everyday techniques. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what that would look like, but that's the whole point. I don't know what it would look like, but it would certainly look different. Thank you, Gene. Here's a question from the live feed uh, from Emma Jensen, excuse me, Emma Jansen, uh, class of 2025 from Askoff, Minnesota. It seems that the ideas of enchantment and misenchantment rely on the fact that the world is sacramental. What makes the world sacramental? And is that an inherent part of nature and the world, or did humans create this notion? Well, I mean, certainly it's my conviction that what makes the world sacramental is uh, the fact that God created it and God um, is capable of showing love and grace and bounty through, uh, through the material stuff of nature. Um, so, I, I mean, the argument, the, the answer I would give to that is a pretty straightforward one. It's a straightforward one. No, I don't believe that humans uh, created this. Uh, you know, this, uh, of course, assumes that human, that, you know, God is, you know, totally a, a fiction created by human beings, which I certainly don't believe. Um, and I know that that would therefore mean that, uh, or the, I guess the next question that would follow from that would be, well, then what would non-religious people, what would secular people want to take from uh, your book or your argument, you know, if, it's, if, if their fundamental assumptions are very different? And my answer to that usually is, well, read the book uh, and uh, see if there's anything of insight um, that you find in it. Uh, I've actually had many secular readers and I've had secular reviewers uh, who have found some kind of nuggets of wisdom in it. Uh, and, um, I've had, uh, you know, secular people email me and tell me, you know, I don't, I don't believe in God, but I found your book to be incredibly incisive and, um, and rewarding. So, um, yeah, I, I guess that's the only thing I can say if you're, if you're a non-religious reader is just read the book and, uh, it's an invitation. Thank you, Gene. Here's another question from the live feed from John Mankey. Um, actually an alum of the college, class of 2010 from St. Paul. I am intrigued by your views of romanticism discussed here. How would you respond to the suggestion that romanticism is susceptible to co-option by the forces of capital? I think that many aspects of the artisanal movements have now been packaged and sold through what seem to me to be capitalist vectors. Thank you. Oh, he's absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right about that. Uh, you know, one one very pertinent example uh, that I explore in the book is um, it was suggested to me by Thomas Frank's uh, great book, The Conquest of Cool, uh, where you know Frank is uh, showing that a lot of the counterculture, the counterculture of the '60s, uh, was in fact not just co-opted but created by corporate business. Um, you're, you're abs he's absolutely right about that. Your, your questioner is right. You know, you, you read so much now about artisanal bread, artisanal beer, artisanal everything, and it's basically just another way for people to make to make money. Now, what I would emphasize then is that is that what's important in uh, politically in trying to make this romantic vision a reality is not just that you get kind-hearted or uh, idealistic entrepreneurs making artisanal bread and artisanal beer. You have to have workers' movements, which is why it's, it's important, I think, uh, to any sort of romantic politics, the labor movement, a revival of the labor movement, uh, which is definitely in the doldrums, to say the least, has to be central. Uh, I, don't, I don't see how any good is going to come to this country 
unless you have a, a revitalized uh, workers movement, uh, which tries to get some sort of control uh, or over the design of technology, which is, uh, you know, which is a very art artisanal value. Uh, so, no, you're absolutely right. This artisanal, artisanal values can and have been co-opted, but they don't have to be. But I think it's important for them uh, in terms of them not being co-opted, that they have to be part of a part and parcel of a movement. Thanks, Gene. Uh, next video question from Frankie Munson. Hello, Professor. Thanks for taking the time to speak today. In 2015, you wrote in the Hedgehog Review about how our society has never really been disenchanted and how certain components of capitalism and commodity fetishism are similar to various aspects of organized religion. That being said, my question is, how do you think automation, the topic of your next book, will fit into that analogy as it evolves itself and our economy more and more rapidly in the coming years? Thank you. Wow, that's a great question. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm still, in a sense, trying to sift through uh, some of these, some of these questions that uh, that you pose here in the book. So some of these answers might seem a bit half baked, or maybe three quarters baked. Um, I think that one of the that that one of the, one of the components of automation. Uh, that I study in the book, and it's actually, I think, that's been a component of, of uh, technological history, uh, you know, from the very beginning, is the human desire to be divine, um, the human desire to to be divinized, which I think is actually, uh, I, I think that actually is a part of human nature, the desire to be godlike. I mean, we are the image and likeness of God um, in, in Christian theology. And so I think that at the core of, of the human creation of technology is indeed this aspiration to master, uh, master the universe and to master our material circumstances. And automation, I see as, in a sense, the, a, a certain way of, of doing that that I don't think you know, necessarily is going to have always a good end. Uh, because the, what, what automation, uh, you know, professes to do under both capitalist and socialist auspices, I'm, you know, I, I might add, is to liberate human beings from work. And one of the questions I want to pose there is, is that necessarily a good thing? Um, because it seems to me that we, we live out our godlike nature, at least partly through work. Um, and so to be completely liberated from work by, by techniques, I think would, in a sense, defeat the purpose of uh, human creativity to, to begin with, um, you know, plus the fact that I think automation is, in fact, look, historically, automation has been uh, has been compelled under capitalism by the desire to accumulate money, right? I mean, what you're trying to do is very simply cut costs and increase productivity, and also achieve greater discipline over the labor process. Uh, but what is all this? Uh, involved with? Well, it's involved with accumulating capital and therefore paying obeisance to uh, the god of mammon. Thank you, Gene. Another question from the uh, feed. This is from Henry, class of 2023 from St. Olaf. And this uh, um, addresses the relationship between capitalism and artisanal cre creativity in a somewhat different way. Uh, one of the big problems with trying to promote the ideals of craft and artisanal creativity is that large corporate consolidation tends to price most people out of being able to afford to support their own romantic ideals. How do we reckon with this? I, I take it the point being with the question here that we can't even get the romantic thing off the ground uh, unless you've got a kind of economic base or something has to happen economically first. I mean, how do we reckon with the fact that some people just are priced out of romantic activity? Well, uh, well, I mean, I, I almost want to say I don't, I don't do policy wonk kind of stuff, but uh, I'll, I'll make a stab at this um, or take a stab at this. I think, again, this, I, you know, I go back to my previous answer about the need for workers' movements. Uh, Workers' movements need to be concerned, I think, not just with wages and benefits, uh, but they also need to be concerned with uh, 
technology and ownership. Uh, I, I think we need a workers' movement which demands control over the means of production. And I think we need workers' movements that try in some way to, uh, you know, foster their own kinds of enterprises that are uh, worker-owned and uh, worker-managed and uh, whose technology is designed by workers themselves. And these workers' movements, I think, have to be in concert with, with uh, political parties. Um, now, <laughs> I mean, obviously, this is a huge problem. Because the Democratic Party, as we've know, as we've seen over the last two weeks, uh, is itself deeply divided uh, between its corporate friendly, uh, I think it's basically its corporate friendly leadership, uh, and also its its rank and file, but also this now uh, this very strong progressive wing, and it's the progressive wing which has uh, put forward ideas, vague ones, I think it, uh, I have to concede, about a Green New Deal, and I think that a green part of what a Green New Deal should look like at its best, is using government money uh, to try to foster and create these kinds of enterprises and, and to create this kind of technology. Um, so I think that, uh, again, I think that the, the romantic vision could potentially have uh, a great deal of political traction, but it's, it's something that has to come in tandem with uh, a labor movement and, uh, you know, I at this point, I mean, let's be honest, the re, uh, some kind of recasting of the Democratic Party, because I, I don't see, at least within our current system, any way for a third party to be, you know, genu genuinely successful. Thank you, Gene. Next uh, video question from Eli. Hi, thank you for coming to speak with us. My name is Eli, and I'm a participant in the public affairs conversation. My question is, in we have never been disenchanted. You quote Kenneth Rexroth, who says, we need to call on a new generation of radicals who know that politics is metaphysically grounded, that draw upon primordial energies greater than the power of our bombs. What does that look like in practice? And are there any examples of people like that we see in politics today that you can point to? Thank you. Well, I mean, to to go to the uh, to the point about um, all politics is metaphysically grounded. I mean, I think that's true for everybody, uh, even people who are aware of it and people who even are unaware of it. Uh, because I, you know, this is one this is one thing where I actually agree with Alistair McIntyre that uh, every kind of morality and every kind of politics presupposes some sort of a metaphysics or an ontology. In other words, it presupposes a certain way of understanding how the world works. Um, and <clears throat> I think that, um, I think that when you have, or at least I, I try to demonstrate in the book that when you have this, uh, or where you have had this kind of sacramental, uh, imagination or the sacramental understanding of, of metaphysics, um, you have had, for example, arts and crafts movements, you know, uh, from the, from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, as I've said again, you know, you know, you, you have uh, had an ecological movement that has been influenced profoundly by uh, Romanticism. You had, I think, also a, a 60s counterculture, which, you know, much of which, as Thomas Frank said, was either, you know, created by corporations or it was, you know, very quickly co-opted. But, uh, you know, which also issued in, um, I, I think, very interesting experiments in uh in, in different kinds of technology and different kinds of approaches to uh, production. You know, this is, this is the era, you know, where people, economists such as E.F. Schumacher are talking about um, alternative forms of technology, which are more ecologically sens sensitive uh, forms of production, which are less, uh, less destructive of, of the earth uh, and so on. So I think you get something of an inkling of what it would look like. Uh, I, you know, we simply have not yet seen it on a mass sort of a scale. Uh, but I, as I said previously, I do think that this is possible. But it is, it is something that, again, you have to create. It's, it's not simply going to happen uh, of, its, of its own accord. Thank you, Gene. A uh, question from the feed from Talia Williams, class of 2024 from St. Olaf. 
How can we as individuals work to improve our sacramental imagination and find enchantment in everyday life? I mean, what if we're not religious? I mean, you've already sort of addressed that, but um, I think she's asking a more practical question here. What if we're not religious? Can enchantment still fit into an atheist's life? Let's focus on the first part of that question, Gene. Um, how can we as individuals work to improve our sacramental imagination and find enchantment in everyday life assuming that we're not uh, religious in some conventional sense? Well, I mean, first let me address, uh, you know, people who are religious uh, and, um, you know, how they can cultivate, you know, a kind of sacramental imagination. Um, <laughs> in some ways, the answer I'm going to give is going to sound very traditionalist. Uh, you know, I think that one cultivates this imagination through practices of prayer, uh, through practices of ritual, uh, through practices of uh, reading uh, as well, and contemplation. Now, uh, I'm certainly not going to say that I'm some sort of uh, monk or that I'm some sort of, uh, you know, contemplative. Um, but I do try, you know, to the extent that I can to to cultivate these uh, these kinds of practices. And, and I do think that they have an impact in how one views you know the, the the everyday relations of one's life. You know one's one's uh, one's friends, one's uh, one's coworkers, one's students, um, the people we love and and cherish. Um, we see them as we really see them and, and try to treat them as the image and likeness of God that they are. Um, as for how one can cultivate this among those who are not religious. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. I, I think, first of all, that since we have never been disenchanted, I would argue also that non-religious people or people who consider themselves secular do in fact have these experiences uh, of, of enchantment. They, except they possibly call them by a different name or they understand them differently. Um, because I don't think that anyone is cut off uh, from the, the sacramentality of the world. Um, I simply don't believe that. Um, how one cultivates that in a non-religious way is, uh, I'm not sure I have an answer for that question. One, uh, one book that I have not yet read, but which I am told I should, uh, is, is by Martin Hagland, uh, entitled, I think it's called This Life. Uh, and it's one which is written by, you know, an, an avowed atheist and about secularist, who is in some ways trying to address the same kinds of issues that I'm addressing in this book about, uh, you know, what, what, kind, what kind of a life is a good one and what kind of a life uh, is, is, is best lived in, in concord with the, with the way the world is. Um, I remember there was, a, there was a reviewer of my book, James Chapel, in the Boston Review, who said that he would be interested in having both me and Hagland on a stage to talk about these things, uh, and that we might actually agree about a lot of things. Thank you, Gene. Another uh, question from the feed from Henry, class of 2023 from St. Olaf. How do you view cryptocurrency in light of commodity, commodity fetishism? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, wow. Uh, I don't know if I have a coherent answer to that one. Um, I am deeply suspicious of cryptocurrency uh, because of its uh, because of its clearly libertarian leanings and uh, the um, the it, its effort to try to have this kind of stateless, uh, unregulated kind of you know financial market. You know, yeah, I'm I'm deeply suspicious of that kind of stuff. Um, what, what, why are you? Why do you have the reservations about that? You say because it's libertarian. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the people. Yeah, a lot of the people who, who are involved in it and who uh, you know are trying to push it are you know these kind of libertarian types who like to think that yeah we can have a currency that's totally unregulated by the state and it's uh, you know we we can I mean first of all the idea that any kind of currency is not going to be regulated by the state is simply outlandish. Um, and yeah, yeah, I, I, if, if you have a currency, make it above board, 
not crypto. Uh, but, uh, but are you inclined to interpret the phenomenon in terms of the general interpretation you give of capitalism generally? I mean, is this a kind of another oh, instance yeah, sure. of this I mean, kind of thing? Crypto, sure, cryptocurrency is, is simply, I, I guess, another variant, or I could say denomination uh, of, this, uh, of, of this capitalist religion. Um, yeah, it's also, I, I guess I'd add, it's a, a very directly ecologically destructive form of it because uh, at least from what I understand about it, uh, the, in order for this crypto, these cryptocurrency markets to, to work, they require enormous amounts of, uh, of resources uh, on, on computers to, to do this. We actually had a guest, uh... Uh, I guess it was three weeks ago, um, Gretchen Morganson, who writes for NBC News on financial matters, who uh, brought our attention to that very phenomenon. Yeah, interesting. Uh, next video question from Caroline Gear. Hello, I would like to ask a question about the connection between evangelical Christianity and economic policy in the United States. Beginning in the 1980s, evangelical Christianity began to spread throughout the United States through the work of televangelists such as Jim Baker and Pat Robinson. This continues to this day with televangelists now such as Joel Olstein. My question is, how did the religious theology or so-called prosperity gospel, in which God would give those he deemed worthy wealth, which was spread by these televangelists, impactful to the Republican Party and its economic policies? Oh, evangelical Christianity was enormously influential, I think, on uh, Republican Party economic policy. I, I think mainly as a reinforcement. Uh, you know, I think that the Republican Party, uh, the relationship between the Republican Party and evangelical Protestantism has in many ways been a fraught one. Um, you know, I mean, first of all, the influence of evangelical Christianity on American capitalism goes back to the very beginning of the 19th century. Um, I think in, you know, in my book, I call evangelical Protestantism a form of enchantment for people on the make. Uh, this, is a, this is a form of religion which a friend of mine, Chris Lehman, has called the money cult. Uh, I think evangelical Christianity is in many ways lock, stock, and barrel, a, a, uh, a religion that is, that is almost totally devoted to, to capitalist values. Uh, you know, from the from the very inception in the 19th century, um, by the 1980s, you know, the prosperity gospel, as it's called, and I think the prosperity gospel has, in some sense, in some shape or form, been around since the 19th century. Uh, this is this is not, I think, a, a, a really new phenomenon. You know, what you're getting in the 1980s and up to the present are basically, you know, uh, you know, evangelical devotees of the money cult who were. Uh, you know they have better teeth and better suits uh, than the than the guys in the 19th century. Um, so I think that the, the Republican Party's economic policy since the 1980s has been influenced, you know, certainly by the evangelical kind of celebration of wealth as a sign of God's favor, you know, upon you, uh, in conjunction with the kind of uh, neoliberal Wall Street sort of economics. Uh, that you've gotten from, you know, the likes of Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig Mies. So I think it's it, the Republican Party economic policy has been a confluence of, of these two things. Thank you, Gene. The origins of it. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say the origins. I think the origins of this confluence I, I talk about in that chapter that you mentioned earlier, the New Testament of capitalism. Yes. Thank you, Gene. Uh, another question from the feed. This is from Kathy Hall, an alum of the college, class of 1976, from Oregon. As I age, I want the spoils from working in the capitalist system to provide food and heat, but I really am more interested in building community and social connections. How do we learn how to weave these two things together? Well, I'm not sure you can. Um, I guess that's bad news. Uh, <clears throat> look, I think the weaving communities together is going to be back together is going to be an enormous task, and it is going to require an epic scale uh, of investment uh, of of money and and resources uh, and time. 
And so I think that's probably going to require also uh, a, 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 re, a reconstitution of a great deal of our of the way that we think about uh, retirement benefits and social insurance and and so on. Um, and look, I'm I'm saying this as somebody who uh, you know is is in his 60s and is looking in another you know 15 20 years to to retire, and um, you know I have to think about this kind of stuff, but I also have to think about the fact that. We're going to have to do a lot of social and economic reconstruction over the next 15 to 20 years, uh, simply because we're going to have to face uh, the consequences of of, uh, of, of global warming, and uh, and that's and that's just the ecological you know problems that we're going to have to deal with. So I'm not sure that you can. Uh, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to to retain a lot of the ways in which we now provide. For we now provide for uh, you know retirement and medical care and so on. We're simply going to have to remake them. You know, in a way that's consonant with um, rebuilding communities. But it, we certainly can't keep going the way we're going with these with these systems. They're simply, I think, insupportable. Thank you, Gene. Here, another question from the feed from Jack Ridgway, class of 2022 from the Behavioral Economics course. Ayn Rand argues that the only way major corporations get their advantages that lead to unfair distribution of wealth is through the government. She argues that if these companies were unable to get special favors from the government, for example, regulations that create massive barriers to entry, money would be distributed exactly based upon what value one could offer to society. In your opinion, does governmental interference help or hurt wealth inequality? Well, it does both, historically. Um, you know, we usually think about uh, government as, you know, the, the regulator of business, and uh, and it is, but uh, you know, it has to be emphasized that it's often business itself that has asked for the regulation, uh, and and not simply to keep out competition, um, but uh, well, often you know, to to keep out competition, but also to keep control over the political process itself. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't think that I, I mean, Ian Rand is, um, I, Ian Rand's view that somehow if we got rid of government regulation, that wealth would be equitably distributed. I think is utter nonsense. I mean, and it, and it depends on, again, what, what do you mean by value to society? Um, if we have inequality of wealth, you're going to have, therefore, inequality of money. And it's since people like Ayn Rand think that money is democratic, it, well, markets and money are not democratic. Uh, you know, in a, in a democracy, it's one person, one vote. In a marketplace, you know, you have as many votes as you have dollars. That's hardly democratic, uh, you know. Number one, and 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 number two, uh, it it seems to me that once again we're we're faced with these questions of value, uh, which seem to be, um, again, priced in in pecuniary terms. Uh, so that's why I don't buy the argument that if you just got rid of government regulation, that uh, money and resources would be allocated efficiently. Um, you know, efficiency is one of those nice words that everybody likes because it sounds great. Oh, yeah, efficiency is a great thing. The thing you have to remember is that in capitalist economic terms, efficiency is about costs and uh, costs and revenues. It's not about whether resources are being uh, allocated toward worthy goals uh, or, or necessary objectives. Thank you, Gene. Another question from the live feed um, from Leo Libet. Uh, class of 2024 from Northfield, Minnesota. If money is in fact a replacement for faith, what is the ideal relationship between the Catholic Church as an institution and money today? Is there something inherently wrong with faith existing in a capitalistic society? Uh, wow, I never, I never thought I'd be a financial advisor to the, to the Catholic Church. Um, Look, I think that I think the Catholic Church uh, 
certainly under under Pope Francis, I mean, you know, should be putting more of its uh, resources toward helping create the kind of world that that, uh, you know, I think the romantics wanted. Um, I think the Ro I think that the Roman Catholic Church should obviously divest itself, uh, you know, from a lot of uh, from a lot of concerns, whether it's the Vatican Bank or whether it's your local church. I mean, I think it should, you know, look very carefully at the money uh, it has invested in, in different places. Um, I think that the Catholic Church should be um, emphasizing the virtues of of charity, you know, much more than they do. And I mean, charity not simply as you know assuaging one's conscience by putting money in the poor box, but I mean, act, you know, actively trying to do things politically uh, and economically to bring uh, to bring about these objectives. Um, and I would also say that I think that the you know the Catholic Church should be placing uh, much more emphasis on issues of poverty and inequality uh, than they have in the past, uh, certainly over the last three to four decades. Um, yeah, so I think, there's, I think there needs to be a shift of emphasis uh, on, uh, on certain issues toward greater emphasis on poverty and inequality. A related question uh, from Tra Pham, uh, class of 2024. I mean, how do you think about uh, excuse me, what do you think about how capitalism and Christianity are generally aligned in America today? So <laughs> well, I think in many minds, they're basically the same thing. Uh, I, you know, I, I think that certainly among evangelical Protestants, uh, you know, you would get the belief that capitalism is simply God's economic system, you know, that it's somehow built in the cosmology of the universe. Uh, you know, certainly... I think that large sectors of Roman Catholicism have basically capitulated to this view as well. Uh, I think maybe maybe a little less so, but uh, I, I still think that that's the case. I certainly don't think that you're going to get any great political uh, imagination or courage on the part of the uh, on the part of the religious establishment in this country. Uh, you know, whether it's whether it's Catholic, Protestant, or whatever. I, you know, I think you know I. I kind of hate to say this, but I think that they're bought and paid for. Uh, so I, you know, I don't, I don't think you're going to get much prophetic, uh, prophetic leadership on these issues from uh, from the clergy. Uh, you know, once again, I think it's it's going to mainly have to swell up from the laity. Thank you, Gene. Last uh, video question from Kenny Lacey, class of 2024. Hello, my name is Kenny Lacey. I'm majoring in political science and French with an international relations concentration. My question tonight is, would you argue that in America and in general in the West, people don't realize their contribution to those theory of capitalism as a love story? On the same note, but different angle, where do you see the progressive criticism about capitalism taking us to? Thank you. Yeah, I certainly do, uh, you know, argue in this book that in many ways capitalism is a love story, uh, it, it, except that it's a love story <laughs> with a tragic ending uh, because, you know, you're loving the wrong things. Uh, you know, and this is, you know, this is, I think, a very Augustinian kind of a point that, you um, we're, we're, we're basically defined by our loves. We're, we're defined by the things and the people that we love. And um, because, because we, we are sinners, you know, in, in this account, we either love the wrong things or we love the things that we should love wrongly. And we, you know, we have, we're, we're constantly trying to, to love them rightly uh, and, to, and to love the right things and the right people. Um, and so I think what capitalism does on a fundamental level is it misshapes our loves. Uh, it, it takes them and disfigures them and perverts them and, and takes them in directions and toward objects uh, that don't deserve them um, or that don't deserve the, the, the kind of love or the amount of love that we do in fact give them. So yeah, capitalism is bad. <laughs> capitalism is a bad romance, uh, you know, in, in a lot of ways. As far as where I think the progressive critique of capitalism would take us, I think this partly depends on what you mean by progressive. Um, 
you know, I understand that that word progressive has gone through any number of iterations over, over the last century or so. Uh, you know, the capital P progressives of the early 20th century were basically, uh, you know, corporatists. I mean, you know, they were they were trying to regulate capitalism. They were trying to tame it, but they certainly weren't trying to transcend it, you know, or overthrow it in, in some way. The progressives today, I mean, seem to me to be a fairly motley sort. Uh, you know, you've got uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, who identifies as a democratic socialist. And you've got other progressives who would not identify as democratic socialists, or they might identify as social democrats. Um, if they are social democrats, or even if they're democratic socialists or self-avowed democratic socialists like Ocasio-Cortez, um, I have a feeling that where they would take us is toward a obviously a more heavily regulated kind of capitalism with a much larger welfare state. You know, we would look much more like the Western European social democracies, uh, and you know, at least before Blair, and you know, the, they all succumbed to neoliberalism in the 1990s. Um, I don't think you would necessarily, progressivism would necessarily take us in the direction of socialism, if one means by that, uh, you know, workers' control of production or, uh, you know, state ownership of uh, all kinds of major industries. I'm not sure that would, they would necessarily go there, but you would certainly go in the direction of, as I said, a much more heavily regulated marketplace and, um, a vast expansion of, of uh, in social spending and uh, social supports, such as you know Medicare for all and a lot of the stuff that is in the current um, in the current uh, reconciliation bill. Except they don't fund it highly enough, in my view. Thank you, Gene. That uh, strikes me as a summative formulation uh, of your general dispositions. And we have now come to the end of our time. Uh, thanks to the audience for joining us tonight in this stimulating exchange with Eugene McCarraher, Professor of History and Humanities at Villanova University. And thanks so much to you, Eugene, for being with us and for sharing with us your views on capitalism as religion. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. This fall term, St. Olaf College's Institute for Freedom and Community continues its series of public events on the theme, Capitalism, Freedom, and Community. The next event in this series is on indentured students, higher ed, and the student loan crisis with Elizabeth Shermer, professor of history at Loyola University of Chicago and author of the book, just recently published by Harvard University Press, entitled Indentured Students, how Government Guaranteed Loans Left Generations Drowning in College Debt. That event will happen in two weeks and a day on Wednesday, October 20th at 7 p.m. Central Time. Learn more about this event and other institute events at institute.stoloff.edu. That is institute.stolaf.edu. We hope you can join us for these events. But for now, good night, be safe, and be well.